All right, hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about plankton, nectin, and benthos. Um, so this is a continuation of uh, last week's, or our previous lecture, where we talked about primary productivity um, and ecosystems in the ocean. Now we're gonna break it down um, into the individual categories. So we'll start off with plankton. So 8.1, we're gonna break this into the three sections. Uh, so the first section we're gonna talk about is plankton. So for the outcomes, we want to explain the different ways of classifying um, and give examples of feeding, life cycles, and the size for each uh, classification of phytoplankton. Um, draw diagrams of, of phytoplankton biomass um, and then how that corresponds to zooplankton biomass over the course of a year uh, for three different areas, the, the polar oceans, the tropical oceans, and then the temperate oceans, which is where uh, we live. And then finally, uh, we want to be able to describe and explain um, how pollution can cause uh, algal blooms, uh, which in our waters uh, often um, results in the release of, of toxins that can help that can harm us and uh, the uh, local um, ecosystem as well. So, if you've ever heard about sea lions, kind of um, baby sea lions washing up on shore or having problems in the spring uh, around here, it's usually uh, uh, attributed to these these algal blooms uh, that occur off our coastline. Um, all right, so first of all, let's let's talk about what phytoplankton is. Um, in, in the most basic sense, uh, it's an organism that drift with ocean currents. So that being said, the, the key word there is drift. So it cannot swim, um, it cannot generate it, its own uh, propulsion for the most part. Some of them can uh, maneuver a, a little bit, but uh, by and large, they are at the mercy uh, of the uh, prevailing currents. Um, so we kind of classify these based on, on feeding styles. So phytoplankton are the producers or the primary producers, which we talked about last time. So these are the guys that uh, photosynthesize. Uh, and then we have our zooplankton, which are our primary consumers, um, sometimes secondary consumers, but for the most part, uh, primary consumers, and then finally uh, bacterioplankton, which are our recyclers or our decomposers. Um, some of these are classified based on lifestyle or life cycle, rather. Uh, our uh, holoplankton are plankton that are uh, in that form the entire life. So, like uh, our diatoms um, or some of our algae, they are their phytoplankton from the, the minute they are. are essentially created um, until they die. And then our meroplankton, uh, which are only plankton um, in certain phases of their life. So when they're born, um, coral, for instance, or, or some jellyfish uh, are planktonic and they, and they travel. And then as they grow, eventually they become um, larger organisms uh, and are no longer categorized as, as plankton. Um, all right, so how big are most plankton? So, so like we said, uh, these things, they can't swim and they must stay suspended in water. And the only way that they're gonna be uh, able to stay suspended is if they're very, very small. There's, there's a concept where um, your weight to your drag ratio um, needs to be such that um, you're able to, to float in those uh, surface layers. We need, it's important for phytoplankton to, to stay in those surface layers because that's where the sun is and that's how they perform. Uh, their photosynthesis. So in that sense, uh, they're required to be very, very, very small. Um, so so quick question. So as a, a spherical cell gets bigger, um, what what do we think uh, tends to happen? So when, when we're thinking about this, we're thinking of their, uh, their um, surface area to, to volume ratio, um, and it's kind of tied to their mass. So as a cell gets bigger, um, their, their mass increases um, very quickly. Um, so in that sense, as its weight increases um, more quickly than its surface area, uh, hold, let, let me rephrase that. So as a, as a spherical cell gets bigger, its weight increases more quickly than its surface area. So yeah, that's kind of what we said, right? Um, its surface area increases more quickly than its weight. Um, well, that really doesn't make sense, right? Because weight is kind of tied to volume and surface area um, is is a, a dimension squared and volume is a dimension cubed, right? So if we are, are moving up, the, uh, the, the weight is gonna increase uh, more quickly. And then the last one stays the same. Um, uh, 
don't think it's that. I think it's probably going to be A, um, and that is indeed the answer. Um, so let's talk about a few different uh, types of phytoplankton. So uh, the big one that, that we see out there, the most abundant, um, by, uh, by all means, is, is diatoms. So these diatoms are single-celled uh, um, organisms. They're surrounded by, by silica. Um, so these, these organisms have a, a silica requirement. So in addition to their nitrogen um, and their phosphorus, uh, and their iron, they also require silica um, so that they can build these shells. And these shells are kind of their, their protective layer or, or their skeleton, if you will. Um, and we find these in, in colder and uh, high nutrient areas. So off the coast of California, we have a bunch of these because cold water is being brought down um, from the North Pacific because we are on an Eastern boundary current. Uh, and we have very high nutrients because we uh, also have uh, the uh, benefit of that, that upwelling um, being on an eastern boundary current as well. Uh, another group is coccolithophores. These are also single-celled. Um, these have a, a shell as well, as you can see in this picture. Um, but these shells are made of, of calcium carbonate. Um, the danger there is with increasing um, uh, acidity in the ocean. Uh, so the pH is dropping in the ocean. Uh, when that does happen, this uh, calcium carbonate doesn't form as readily and these shells uh, tend to begin to dissolve. So with ocean acidification, we anticipate that these, these um, particular uh, types of phytoplankton will, will be in danger. And we typically find these in, in temperate and, and warmer areas. So I'm uh, not going to find a whole bunch of these uh, off the coast of California, uh, but definitely in some, some warmer water areas. Uh, next, we have dinoflagellates. We'll have a bunch of these off the coast of California. Uh, these are also single-celled, uh, can be photosynthetic or um, heterotrophic, uh, or, or both, right? So what that means is um, they can either photosynthesize, so they're autotrophs, um, or they can eat other organisms uh, as heterotrophs uh, in order to uh, obtain uh, energy. Um, so these are some very, very unique uh, uh, phytoplankton that we have. They have uh, flagella, uh, hence the name, dinoflagella, um, and, and they use these flagella to move. So you can see these little appendages. Um, they will swirl those appendages around, uh, generate a, uh, a pressure gradient, and they'll use that to kind of propul uh, uh, for propulsion uh, in a particular direction. Now, uh, that's kind of counterintuitive if we're thinking about phytoplankton, because phytoplankton are supposed to be drifters uh, and not operate under their own power. Uh, but in this case, they're just doing it for very short distances. Um, and in general, they're flowing uh, with the current uh, and not able to determine where on the map uh, they're going to, to go. They can just travel in short bursts and short distances. Some of these uh, dinoflagellates are, are bioluminescent, uh, meaning uh, when, a, when a wave crashes or some sort of energy uh, is transferred into the water, um, these, these organisms will light up. So if you remember, maybe a, a few months ago, off the coast of Newport Beach and pretty much all of Southern California, uh, there was bioluminescence um, in, the, in the waves breaking. Um, and that was uh, due to some phytoplankton um, with the capability of, of bioluminescence. And when the waves crash, that energy is, is transferred through their cells and, and they, can, they can light up. Um, finally, uh, we look at cyanobacteria. So uh, like the name uh, says, these are bacteria. So they're very, very, very small organisms. Um, haven't been studied very much. Uh, we've just been able to um, really wrap our head around these guys using um, some, some DNA sequencing. Uh, we can't really do much through microscopes um, or, or some, some finer uh, identifying um, instrumentation. Uh, but with the DNA, we are making progress. So, so now we're starting to learn a lot more about these guys. And what we're finding is they're responsible for a huge portion um, of the uh, photosynthesizing biomass. So that, that net primary production in the, uh, in the ocean. Uh, a lot of it is attributed to these uh, cyanobacteria, um, which uh, if we didn't think about that before and we kind of thought it was all phytoplankton um, in, the, in the context of, of building models, uh, it's important that we find out the, the proper partitioning between um, these two groups so that we can kind of project into the future um, with uh, greater certainty.
Uh, okay, a couple more. So uh, radiolarians, these are single celled uh, with silica shells. These guys are kind of cool because they, they end up looking like uh, Christmas ornaments, essentially. It looks like they have glass um, shells. So that's what these shapes are at the, the very top. These are uh, radiolaria. You find these in cold, high nutrient areas. So more kind of towards uh, the poles. And we find a handful of them here uh, as well as, uh, however, not as abundant as uh, the uh, diatoms and, and dinoflagellates that we talked about in the previous slides. Um, for Aminifera, these are single-celled organisms. They have the calcium carbonate shells. So these guys are also um, in danger when we're thinking about ocean acidification. Um, temperate and warm areas. So these guys live in the same uh, regions as those coccolithophores. Um, we can anticipate uh, some, some pretty large shifts uh, to these regions of the, of the globe um, with warming and, and ocean acidification. Um, Finally, we'll go to uh, copepods, which are some of our uh, s smaller zooplankton that we consider um, strictly zooplankton. Uh, these are microscopic shrimp-like animals, um, kind of built up of, of an exoskeleton. Um, when you think about uh, the, the show SpongeBob SquarePants and you think about plankton, this is kind of the guy that they, were, they modeled him after, like a single eye, um, very simple creature with a, with a two large antenna. Um, huge portion of, uh, of the globe's uh, zooplankton biomass is, uh, is these guys' copepods. Uh, the rest of them are, are pretty much made up of, of krill. So these are our larger size class, or our macroscopic zooplankton. Um, kind of look like very small uh, shrimp. Uh, and these are those big, huge red patches that we see um, whales kind of chasing down uh, when they're feeding, uh, mostly made up of, of these krills. So um, much smaller than shrimp, only uh, about five centimeters long. Uh, and we can kind of find a, a huge abundance of these, of these krill in, in uh, colder uh, polar waters. So the Southern Ocean has a, a very, very large uh, abundance um, and very important for uh, the formation uh, of the food chain near, uh, near Antarctica. And uh, finally, uh, our last platonic um, is uh, the jellyfish. So the jellyfish, 95% of uh, the jellyfish is made up of water, um, have a few chambers of gas tucked in, um, in between those uh, uh, cells of water. And these kind of act like a sail. So they just end up uh, floating in water and, and end up uh, with the tide. They can undulate um, occasionally, and that will uh, propel them uh, briefly, um, but but not for for sustained swimming. All right. So, like we talked about uh, near the beginning, uh, the the hollow plankton uh, versus the marrow plankton. Hollow plankton spend their whole lives as plankton. So these are our, our diatoms, radiolaria, um, dinoflagellates, foraminifera, and then uh, examples of our marrow plankton. So only. Uh, a short period of their life are uh, sea urchins, starfish, uh, coral, believe it or not, um, octopus. Um, so let's see if we can figure out who's who in this one. So um, very briefly and for your, uh, for your, your lecture assignment, uh, which of these images do you think is, is a baby octopus? So uh, appendages on, on almost all of them. Um, but what would you go with? I'm thinking octopus is pretty smart, so looking for a big brain. Um, not enough legs on this guy. Too many legs on that guy. Uh, yeah, so C. C is the one we're going to go with. You can see it's uh, eight legs starting to form here at the bottom and uh, the big old brain on Brad um, as uh, octopus is a pretty smart creature. Um, as far as size classifications go, um, we kind of break it down... Um, into, into these classes. So our, our megaplankton, our, our, our very largest ones are, are jellyfish and they're gonna be greater than uh, 20 millimeters um, or larger than uh, two centimeters. Uh, macroplankton are gonna be from two to 20 millimeters. Uh, krill kind of fall in that category. The copepods are a little bit smaller. We consider the mesoplankton, so 0.2 to two. Uh, microplankton, this is where we start to fall into our, our uh, Larger diatoms are foraminifera and our dinoflagellates. Um, our nanoplankton is where most of our diatoms fall in. Some of our smaller dinoflagellates 
um, and then picoplankton. Uh, there's a there's a handful of, of very small um, we call them nano uh, flagellates, so very small dinoflagellates in the picoplankton um, size class. Um, but mostly that's going to be made up of, of bacteria. Um, so kind of moving on and thinking about productivity in different areas of the ocean, I kind of just want to pick your brain and get you thinking about um, limiting factors uh, in, in different areas of the ocean. So if you think about the polar ocean um, and the surface of the polar ocean, what might limit uh, productivity uh, in those oceans? Um, so if we're thinking about phytoplankton and their requirements and uh, as, as the base of the food chain and um, the photosynthetic um, equation, we know that they need water and carbon dioxide. Uh, those are always going to be, uh, well, water most definitely is always going to be in abundance because we're in an ocean. Um, carbon dioxide, we have very high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's diffusing into the surface ocean, so that shouldn't be limiting. Um, nutrients, nutrients is always a possibility depending on where you are um, in the globe, so I would keep that in mind. Um, and then light, uh, if we think about the poles, um, Throughout the year, certain areas of the globe get absolutely no light, and the polar region is is definitely um, fall within that that category. So during the winter, uh, at the the very uh, ends of the Earth, at the poles, we experience uh, 24 hours of darkness, and uh, no photosynthesis can actually take place. So I would definitely say light, um, and I would also say nutrients. So in this case, um, it's going to be light and nutrients. So here's um, an example of how the polar ocean is kind of uh, set up. Um, in the summer, we're limited by nutrients, and in the winter, we're limited by light. Um, so that kind of makes sense. We, we already talked through the, the light portion. Uh, in the winter, uh, there's 24 hours of darkness, so we're not going to receive that. In the summer, uh, we're limited by nutrients. Um, and we can kind of see that in this in this picture here right so um, at high latitudes uh, we don't get uh, a surface layer that warms up uh, much more than our deep layer so we don't really get stratification we're constantly mixing up some fresh nutrients um, so when we do begin to receive some sunlight in the springtime we begin to see our phytoplankton bloom and we can see that in the graph here with our diatom biomass so our phytoplankton will bloom when the sun finally comes out um, and then they will begin to deplete the nutrients uh, in the surface layer. Uh, the zooplankton will begin to spike um, in response to the diatom because that's their food source. Uh, and then the zooplankton population will finally get high enough to uh, reduce the diatom biomass to a very small number um, by feeding on them. Uh, and then it remains low until uh, the fall and then back into the winter when uh, we receive no light again and the cycle uh, starts over. Um, it's going to be a little bit different. Oop, I never changed this slide, so uh, we'll give you guys a freebie here. Uh, if we go to the tropical oceans, right? Um, so what's going to be limiting uh, in the tropical ocean? So the tropical oceans are near the equator, um, and near the equator we definitely don't have a problem with light. We have pretty consistent lighting throughout the, the um, entirety of the year, throughout all the seasons. Um, and once again, water and carbon dioxide are always going to be abundant. So in this case, tropical oceans, we're only going to be limited by nutrients. Um, and this is kind of uh, what we end up with. And this is why we end up with uh, nutrients being uh, our limited factor here. Is we always have a, a, a picnicline and a, and a sharp um, uh, difference between our, our surface layer and our deep layer, right? So our surface layer is up here and it is constantly being heated by the sun. Um, however, this lower layer um, is cold and out of the reach of the sun. Uh, the densities between these two re remain very different and, and it keeps them separated. So any nutrients that is forming in this deep water cannot penetrate up to this area where the uh, phytoplankton exists. So what we end up seeing in these tropical areas is our biomass just stays relatively constant and, uh, and kind of low uh, throughout most of the year, um, even though we have uh, plenty of sunlight, uh, we're unable to bring those nutrients up to the surface layers where they're required for uh, phytoplankton growth. Um, finally, let's kind of look in between uh, the polar 
and the uh, tropical region. So let's look at the temperate ocean. So this is where uh, we live. And if you look at this, uh, this graphic, it looks very complicated, but don't worry, I'll, I'll kind of uh, dissect it for you. So up top here, we have our months. Um, inside, we have phytoplankton in the green. Um, we have zooplank zooplankton in the black. Um, nutrient concentrations are blue. And the sunlight intensity is going to be this, this orange, right? Um, so as we move from the winter, um, the winter time, we have a very uh, shallow angle on the, on the, on the sun. Um, so not very much sunlight penetrates the ocean, uh, even though we do have um, some good nutrients uh, because we don't have a, a, a large density separation between the surface layer and the deep layer. So we're bringing up nutrients. Unfortunately, we don't really have the sunlight um, to support any growth during the winter time. However, as, this, as the angle of the sun rises in the springtime, now we're able to get some of that, uh, that light to penetrate and we start to experience a, a bloom of, of phytoplankton. As we move into the summer, um, the nutrients become depleted. Uh, the zooplankton begin to move in to this region where the phytoplankton are and they begin to feed on the phytoplankton. Um, and then finally, uh, in the fall, uh, the phytoplankton population is, is relatively depleted um, and uh, the zooplankton move back down into deeper waters to prepare uh, for winter um, and to start the, the process all over again. Um, so this is kind of a, a summary of how they look um, over top of each other. If we're just looking at phytoplankton biomass, um, tropical is low uh, and stays consistent throughout the entirety of the year. Uh, Mid-latitudes, we experience a, a large pulse in the spring, and in many cases, a smaller pulse at the very beginning of uh, fall. Um, and then the polar regions, we have a huge uh, bloom in late spring, um, and then that drops off substantially um, and continues to drop off uh, for the rest of the year. All right, so that does it for plankton. So if you need to take a break, go ahead and, and pause now. Uh, otherwise, we will continue and move on to nectin. So nectin is kind of a strange uh, term, but basically it just means anything that is suspended in the water. So um, learning outcomes for this section, we want to be able to explain the methods that nectin use to, to stay afloat or stay in the water um, and not stuck on top or, or, or lying on the bottom. Uh, be able to describe how they uh, acquire their prey and the difference between cold-blooded and warm-blooded fish. Um, different strategies that Nectin used to avoid becoming prey. And then finally, uh, a few examples of uh, reptiles, seabirds, and uh, marine mammals, uh, and talk about their, their special adaptations uh, for living in the ocean. All right, so first things first, let's think about how Nectin stay afloat. So unlike plankton, uh, these are larger bodies. Um, with those larger bodies come skeletal structures, uh, organs, and stuff like that. And and with that also comes weight. So um, now these organisms are, are so large that they can't simply uh, just float in the water and, 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 and hope to survive. So, um, so they have to, to maintain uh, their position in the water. So there's a few ways that they do that. And the first way um, is through internal gas chambers, or you might've heard these uh, called swim bladders, um, which is what we call them in fish. Um, but depending on the organism, um, they might not be considered bladders. Um, and essentially, well, what they're doing is, is filling these up with, with oxygen um, or gases uh, and deflating them. So they're acting like balloons inside their body uh, where they fill it up. And uh, as they fill it up with gas, they would, they would ascend. Um, and as they uh, lose gas um, or decrease the volume of that swim bladder, um, then it would deflate and, and they would sink. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, they also have uh, the capability of, of act actively swimming. Um, and a few of them are, are, are very awkward in, in how they accomplish this. So um, quick question here, just to get you thinking about it. Uh, for this animal here, which direction do you believe um, it's traveling? So, so this is a squid. Um, do you think that it swims in the direction of A, or do you think that it swims in the direction of B? Um, it looks like we might have like a fin up here, so maybe that pushes it towards B, um, but the tentacles might also propel it towards A. So who knows? What do you think? Um, 
Cool. So the answer is is actually A. So it's going to be moving. Um, if it imagine it's the shape of a bullet, it's going to be moving towards uh, the left. But you might be surprised at, at how it's accomplishing this. A lot of people think that they're just pushing with those tentacles, um, but they actually uh, can uh, use uh, the siphon and water jet method to, to really uh, burst, uh, have high bursts in speed um, if, they're, if they ever feel, feel threatened. So um, for the most part, they can travel slow with uh, gentle strokes of their, of their tentacles. Um, but uh, in a, an emergency, they would uh, expel water through this siphon um, and uh, propel themselves very fast through the water, and even in some cases uh, out of the water, like you see in this example here. Um, but that's just uh, that's just the fish. So they're definitely a, an exception. Um, but there are, are other ways that that um, that fish swim. So um, in addition to the squid. Um, fish can swim in a handful of these different methods um, and basically what they're doing is, is taking advantage of, of a pressure gradient. So as they, as they move their body or move their muscles in this, this wavy motion, um, they're setting up high pressure centers and low pressures which will uh, in essence propel them forward. So one way that they do this is uh, to undulate um, and that's kind of like using their entire body so kind of that snake motion, um, a subundulation, uh, using pretty much just the back half of their body um, and then uh, oscillated, which is basically when their fin is just pivoting um, on a single on a single hinge. Um, for the most part, um, many fish are going to be that sub undulated, uh, but you will see a handful of those others out there as well. Um, when we consider some of our our, our mammals, uh, whales and dolphins, uh, we have a, a vertical motion um, of of um, propelling uh, through the water, and you can see that on the right here. All right, so how do these nectin um, obtain prey? There's basically uh, kind of two options that, that, that they can use, two strategies. They can either be lungers um, or cruisers. So uh, a lunger is something that's going to be like waiting in the rocks um, or camouflaged or, or standing by and just waiting for something to come by, a, uh, a, a, a target of opportunity, um, and they're going to lunge at it really quick uh, and, and take that prey down. A cruiser on the other hand, is something that is, is kind of built for speed, um, and they're going to actively swim and seek prey and, and chase them down. Um, so uh, those cruisers uh, often have to swim uh, faster, and with that fast swimming comes uh, more energy use. Um, so this is when we start to consider warm-blooded versus cold-blooded fish. Um, so many of the lungers are, are cold-blooded fish. Um, so they have the same temperature as the environment. They tend to be very slow. Um, and they kind of wait for a, uh, a, a prey or a victim to, to approach them. Uh, Warm-blooded fish are, are able to uh, maintain their body temperatures. Um, they tend to be faster. Their muscles uh, are more efficient. Um, but with this, they also require uh, more food uh, to keep this, this energy going. So um, cruisers have to, to hunt um, a lot more than, than lungers typically do. Um, so we're talking about the, the, the hunters. Now let's think about the, the, the hunted. Um, so how uh, do we avoid predation? So um, one of the largest ways is, is through schooling. Uh, and this kind of occurs as, as single fish uh, group together um, in small groups and, and up to, I, I've seen balls of estimated millions of fish. Um, the advantage here is, is that the, the fish move together. Um, they are kind of avoiding predation because they look like a, a massive object and it's kind of overwhelming to uh, any uh, potential um, predator. Uh, it's very difficult for a predator to pick out one individual. Um, and if we're thinking about a predator uh, cruising the open ocean looking for prey, um, if we school up in a very tight ball, there's less of a chance that that predator is going to be able to, uh, to track us down um, and in engage us. Um, all right, so yeah, that pretty much covers schooling. Uh, there's a there's a few other ways, um, uh, a little a little bit more more risky perhaps, um, and these are the uh, the symbiosis relationships that that many of these uh, ocean creatures uh, have. So the first kind of symbiosis we have is uh, commensalism, uh, and this is basically when a, a less dominant organism benefits a, a dominant organism. 
um, without kind of uh, creating harm. So a big big one here is, is these remoras. So they kind of uh, attach to a shark um, and then they kind of clean up around the shark, any, any deposits that, that might grow on the shark, they're constantly cleaning it. So the shark's benefiting a little bit, but basically what they're doing is they're standing by for the shark to, to take something down and to have a meal. And when chunks of uh, food fly past the, the shark's mouth because it can't uh, take everything, these guys will benefit and kind of pick that off. So they don't have to hunt, but they get a nice meal um, in return. Uh, another, one in, another one we think about is, is mutualism. So this is when both organisms are benefiting. Um, your classic example of this is a, a clownfish and an anemone. So uh, the clownfish uh, doesn't get stung by the anemone, so it uh, seeks protection uh, inside of it where predators uh, do get stung, so they won't go into the anemone uh, to seek out the clownfish. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the clownfish will squeak, uh, scare off like butterfly fish uh, that potentially feed on the anemone. Um, and then by swimming inside of the anemone, uh, they're generating a current uh, which also helps pass through um, any potential food for, for the anemone. So everybody benefits in this situation. Um, and the next one's kind of gross. So if you want to click 30 seconds ahead, go ahead and do it. Um, otherwise, the final one is, is uh, parasitism. So that's basically when one organism benefits at the expense of another. So um, basically the, the health of, of the host is going to deteriorate because uh, the, the parasite um, has taken hold. In this case, we have an, an isopod has uh, taken up in, in the mouth of a fish um, and it's uh, chances are stealing a, a good portion of the, the food that the fish is trying to eat. So the fish will hunt, uh, it'll pull prey into its mouth, that isopod will then uh, intercept that prey and uh, do with it what it will and ultimately keeping the fish from receiving those nutrients. All right, so, so that's the nasty one. So we have a few other ways to avoid predation. Um, Transparency is a big one in the ocean, so there's a lot of uh, organisms like jellyfish, you can see uh, right through them, um, or camouflage. There's some um, organisms that um, can actively camouflage, so we think about uh, the octopus or, or the squid, uh, they'll change colors um, so that you, you can't see them. Uh, another one is, is speed, so we kind of talked about uh, the squid, how it has that siphon and it can jet very fast so it can get away um, very very quickly. Uh, secretions, so uh, poisons or, or sticky substances or, or inks, so octopus and squid will release an ink. Um, and finally uh, they uh, can pretend to be another organism or they can they can mimic another organism. So um, I guess a, a good example would be some some of the tropical fish have like eyes on the on the back of their body um, so it looks like they're swimming in the opposite direction. So if something attacks them, it kind of nips at their tail and they can, they can swim away. Um, yeah, so those are basically uh, all of our ways to avoid predation. So a couple of our other animals just to uh, consider. Uh, one is seabirds. M uh, many of these birds have developed a close relationship with the ocean. So uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention these guys. Some of these uh, penguins most definitely spend a huge portion of their time um, underwater and hunting uh, exclusively fish. Um, pelicans and comorants are also uh, exclusively fish hunters. Um, yeah, so quite a few of them. Basically, many of these are, are reproducing on land, but they get their resources uh, from the ocean. So uh, with that, they end up following these resources and that kind of ends up being their, their migratory pattern. Um, some of these birds won't see land for uh, months at a time as they uh, follow um, like krill through through a migratory pattern. Um, and then obviously many are, of them are uh, adapted to dive or swim. So some of them like the albatross will come in from high and, and dive down, uh, the comorant as well. Um, or we have uh, the penguin, which is an excellent example of a, of a uh, long distance swimmer. All right, uh, marine mammals. Uh, these are kind of what we refer to as our charismatic megafauna. When we want somebody to care about the ocean, these are really what we, uh, we kind of throw out there um, because they, they kind of garner a, a lot of sympathy. So we have three kind of main main classes. We have our, our carnivores, which are like our sea otters, polar bears, um, and things like that. Um, 
We have our uh, Sirenia, which are manatees and, and dugongs, so kind of like, like our weird creatures where we didn't really know where to place them. Um, and then finally, we have uh, our whales, um, so broken down into tooth and then uh, baleen whales. Um, so sea otters, sea otters um, are, are cute and uh, yeah, pretty, fu pretty funny creatures. We used to have a ton of them um, off the coast of California here. Um, however, their, their fur was really sought after uh, in the 18 and uh, early 1900s, so they were pr hunted pretty harshly. Um, once we finally tried to, to rebound the populations, we discovered that um, as a result of reducing the sea otter populations, the sea urchin population, which you can see this one eating here, um, kind of took off. Uh, that sea urchin population uh, kind of uh, did itself a disservice by eating all the kelp uh, and then all three species kind of died off. So that's why we have a very uh, small proportion of uh, kelp forests in comparison to um, previous centuries uh, off the of coast of California here. Um, but these these communities are rebounding. We're, we're actively trying to um, reestablish them and, and things are looking good, but uh, definitely an example of how a, a whole ecosystem can collapse. Uh, we also have our, our polar bears to the north. Uh, these guys have been struggling just because uh, we're losing a lot of sea ice. These guys kind of travel great distances and uh, rely on uh, some floating ice in order to um, receive some reprieve and take a nap from, from swimming uh, during their hunts. Um, these these floating chunks of ice are becoming more and more scarce, and unfortunately, a lot of these bears aren't as successful um, in their hunts. So we're seeing these populations decline, and hopefully um, we can help them out pretty soon. So now we're moving on to these, these manatees and, and these dugongs. These guys are um, kind of difficult to place. If you, if you just looked at them um, at a glance, you would almost assume that they were the same thing, but um, I challenge you to kind of take a look at the picture uh, and kind of see how you would best differentiate between um, these two these two species. Um, and our options here are the shape of the head, the size of the flippers, uh, or the shape of the tail. So uh, shape of the head, uh, kind of both of them look kind of like a droopy dog. So I would say I uh, can't really distinguish that. Flippers are the same. Um, but if I look at the tail, uh, the dugong kind of has a tail that's more like a, a dolphin uh, or a whale while the manatee is more like a, a beaver paddle, uh, if you will. So um, that's definitely the way to tell the difference between uh, the two of them there. Um, finally, we'll move on to uh, our, our whales. Uh, here's just kind of a, a size comparison. We have a diver up on the right here, and then the size of, of all these different uh, whales throughout. Um, some common uh, themes al uh, among all whales uh, are the streamlined uh, shape, uh, insulating layer of blubber. So we're going to have a, a little bit of fat on on all of these uh, on all these whales. Um, limbs were modified to flippers, so these are are kind of creatures that came off land and back into the ocean, as opposed from the ocean to the land, um, which is kind of the the traditional trajectory. Uh, blowholes on the top of the skull, um, few to no hairs. And then that horizontal tail fin for propulsion. So that's a kind of a, a key one there. And then very efficient at oxygen usage. Our lungs um, process less than 10% of every breath. Um, and a whale's lungs can process um, almost uh, up to, to 70%, I believe is the number. Um, so our, our first kind of subcategory of, of whales is our toothed whales. So these are dolphins, porpoise. Uh, here we have killer whales. Um, these are kind of what we consider are, are very uh, intelligent. Um, they form complex and, and long-lived uh, social groups. So they kind of exist as a family or as a pod. So these guys will get together and, uh, and, and may never uh, break up. Uh, and then they use uh, echolocation uh, for communication and hunting as well. Uh, the other type is our baleen whales. So these are like our blue whales, our humpbacks. Um, and they feed on, on the zooplankton or, or krill and, and copepods um, using uh, baleen filters in their mouth. And these baleen filters, you can see right here, are made of keratin. So what they do is they, they open their mouth, they create a, a low pressure inside their mouth, which pulls the water in. In with that water comes krill. Uh, they close off 
the filters, push up their tongue, uh, filter out the water, and then all that krill remains and they're able to uh, consume that as food. Very, uh, very interesting uh, adaptation. So you can see the examples here, um, the baleen there, and you can see it with its mouth closed here. It's got a big old uh, chin full of water and it will begin to uh, expel that water keeping behind the, the krill that was inside. Okay, so that is the end of our uh, second section. Now we'll move on to our very last section, the, the benthos. So what happens at the, uh, at the bottom of the ocean. So for this section, we want to be able to explain the patterns um, and the abundance in benthic life. Uh, we want to be able to describe adaptions for these organisms um, in intertidal zones. And in these intertidal zones, we want to consider um, kind of two different two different regions. We want to consider rocky intertidal zones and sediment in, uh, covered intertidal zones or, or like sandy beaches. Um, we also want to be able to explain the difference between kelp forests and, and coral reefs and why they come to be and what the difference is um, and be able to describe uh, benthos we find in the, in the very deep oceans um, in the abyssal plains and, and near hydrothermal vents and such. All right, so a quick review. This slide should look uh, uh, relatively familiar from our previous lecture. So like we said, of our uh, quarter million marine species, 98% of the species uh, that we have are actually benthic. So um, we just talked about uh, what was uh, in the open ocean, and that's only 2%. The, the rest of it is now living on the floor, right? Um, so benthic live on the, live on the seafloor and, and uh, pelagic are, are that, the open ocean. Um, so here, what we're looking at is a map of where benthic life um, occurs in the ocean. So we can kind of see that it's um, along the shelves, uh, a little bit richer um, on like, like our eastern boundary currents here. Uh, definitely... Uh, lower concentrations of, of benthic life in the, in the open ocean or in the deep ocean. Um, here, let's look uh, at this that we have seen before. It's uh, that chlorophyll map, so how we kind of judged uh, primary production. Um, the warmer colors are uh, higher concentrations of chlorophyll. And we can kind of see a, a similar pattern, right? Where we see high concentrations of, of benthic biomass we also see high concentrations of, of chlorophyll, right? Um, so with that in mind, uh, what do you think is uh, the most uh, logical interpretation of these two maps? So uh, we can say either the benthic ecosystems are completely in independent and what's happening here has nothing to do with what's happening over here. We can say that the benthic ecosystem supplies food uh, to the subsurface or to the surface ecosystem. So whatever happens down here gets brought up um, to here uh, as food, um, or the benthic ecosystem obtains food from the surface ecosystem. Um, so that's kind of a tricky one, right? So the benthic ecosystem supplies nutrients um, to the surface ecosystem, but not food. I would say that the benthic ecosystem does obtain food from the surface ecosystem because as organisms die uh, at the surface, they seek out, end up on the ocean floor, and the benthic ecosystem uh, processes it at that time. So I would definitely say that the answer here is, is C. All right, so, so let's think about what's, what's growing on the, the bottom of the ocean. Um, the first thing we want to do is think about primary producers. So before this, we had thought about primary producers as our phytoplankton, but there are some plants that grow um, on, on the bottom of the ocean and not suspended um, in that microscopic form. So we have a few like seagrass um, and, and seaweeds. Um, seaweeds are pretty common uh, along uh, the Southern California coast here. Um, red seaweeds are found in warm and cold water. So we'll have a couple of those here. Uh, green, we don't have much of. We will see uh, a few of them um, uh, in in some of our marshes and our lagoons or Newport Harbor or Newport Bay, um, and then brown. Uh, and those are, are usually our larger ones, and, and kelp kind of fall in that category. So, seeing a little rebound of kelp here in Southern California, if you go to 
uh, Laguna, they have some pretty good uh, kelp forests down there. Uh, if we're thinking about the intertidal benthos, um, so the so uh, the area that falls between uh, high tide and low tide, um, it's it's a very dynamic area, right? So we have uh, one part of the day where we're at the the highest tide and everything is is submerged. However, throughout that process, uh, throughout the time of the day, um, that water recedes, and now a lot of these organisms um, are exposed. Uh, to um, predation, uh, open air, um, and they're not they're not submerged in that in that marine environment anywhere. So some of the challenges that these guys face are are strong waves. Um, obviously, predators. You see a lot of birds uh, cruising the the shoreline or or the the rocks looking for for prey as the tides change. Um, changing temperatures, drying out, or or a lack of space. Right, it gets. Pretty crowded as you're as you're kind of chasing the the water line. If uh, a bunch of crabs are trying to end up in the same last little uh, tide pool, right? Um, so so what are some of the adaptions that that some of these species uh, have gone through? Um, for drying out, uh, some of them have the ability to uh, she seek shelter. So some of them, like like uh, the hermit crab, will live in a shell, so it can pull back into its shell. Um, have a little moisture in there and that can sustain them for long enough until uh, the tide comes back. Um, strong wave activity. So for some of the macroalgae like the kelp, uh, they develop strong fast holds um, where they can like grab onto rocks and they, they won't get ripped away. Um, other things are, are camouflage. So you see a lot of like lipids uh, on, on rocks if you go to the tide pools uh, around uh, Laguna or Newport Beach, and they're very hard to see until you get very close because they're they're very well uh, camouflaged. So there's definitely uh, a number of adaptations. I would recommend spending some time uh, on this table and just becoming familiar with with a few of them. Um, so that was the the rocky shores. So where where things can kind of stick into place. Um, the other area that we consider is our, our sediment covered shores. So this would be associated with your your standard beach, right? So so what are some of the challenges here? Well, as the tide uh, recedes, now you're exposed uh, on sand, and a lot of times you can't camouflage yourself um, in sand very well, right? Um, so you're you're very susceptible to predation. Those birds are going to be cruising the shoreline, and you could get you could get picked off. Um, relatively readily. So so what are some of the adaptations that they have? Well, um, a lot of these crabs will dig down uh, in the sand and, and kind of hide out. There's um, some worms that will actually follow uh, the water line. So as the water recedes, they won't follow uh, the water um, uh, along the surface. They'll dig down um, and kind of chase the water line uh, as it recedes um, in the sand. And that's kind of what you see, like if you if you walk the the shoreline and you see those little bubbles coming up, a lot of time, times those are going to be um, either those crabs or these worms that are actively digging or moving around, and that causes those little little bubbles to pop up. Um, so talking about uh, some of these organisms that 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 can bury themselves down into the sediment, um, we consider these uh, in faunal. Um, so if we're if we're living inside the sediment. Uh, like all these these worms and these clams and some of these bivalves, uh, these are considered in fauna, in faunal because they're inside the sand. Anything that's cruising around the top, like our snails or our crabs or anything above uh, the surface, we consider those um, epifaunal. So, so just to distinguish those two definitions, uh, that's the difference between uh, above and, and below the surface. Um, kind of moving uh, off of the, the intertidal zone, um, but still uh, in shallower water, um, we consider uh, the, these rocky bottoms very, very productive region, regions. And this is what we have a lot of uh, on the coast of Southern California here. So um, very, very rich in life, uh, supports these, these kelp forests. Uh, as soon as we can, can have some kelp forests or, or some primary production, uh, then we will also see a, a, an ecosystem kind of pop up in that same region. So uh, these, these kelps, uh, provide food for, for mollusks, starfish, and, and urchins, um, and then those provide for the fish and the sea otters and, and everything else up the, the, the food chain. So very important to have these rocky bottoms um, provide those footholds for 
these these seaweeds um, and these these algae. Um, so in these regions, in these uh, uh, shallow offshore rocky bottom areas, this is what we kind of see in California. So um, very diverse, right? We've got some. We got a sheep sheep's head here on the top uh, left, uh, sculpin over here on the top right, uh, shovel head, um, Garibaldi. So this is our our state uh, fish right here, um, and a lobster. So a lot of a lot of fish, a, a lot of beautiful uh, creatures down there. Uh, very diverse, um, and it's crazy just to to think when you're standing at the ocean's edge that just beyond. Uh, the surface and, and your site is is all of this uh, beautiful stuff, right? Um, another beautiful area are, are coral reefs. We don't have uh, much coral uh, in our area here, but in area, other areas of the world, um, they do have uh, these ecosystems. Um, coral reefs aren't uh, specifically um, just coral. A lot of these areas uh, also have sponges and mollusks and, and, and other algae. Um, and, and actually, coral uh, requires phytoplankton um, in a symbiotic relationship. Many coral do uh, to actually survive. So you also find uh, a lot of a lot of that phytoplankton, right? Um, so when we're thinking about coral, uh, coral is it's it's not a plant. We might kind of look at it as a plant. It's actually an animal, um, and they consist of of individual polyps, right? Each of these polyps has uh, stinging tentacles that they use. Um, so this is the polyp. These are the stinging tentacles. They use those tentacles um, to uh, to grab to grab prey um, and bring them in and, and consume them at the top of the polyp. There, many of them, like I said, have a symbiotic relationship um, uh, with uh, dinoflagellates, so those phytoplankton. So they kind of live um, along the the tentacles here, and they kind of provide the color uh, that we see. Uh, in the in the in the coral. So when you when we hear about uh, coral bleaching, a lot of times it's not the coral itself dying; it's the symbiotic um, zoanthia uh, dying off, and then that's how we uh, end up losing uh, that pigmentation. All right. Uh, so these coral reefs, uh, kind of uh, specific to to warmer waters, um, from eighteen degrees uh, to thirty degrees Celsius. Um, so thinking about uh, warm waters and where warm waters form, uh, which side of ocean basins do you think we would most likely find uh, coral reefs? So think about uh, our flows of our gyres, um, where in those flows of gyres we're going to be picking up warm water um, and bringing it across a basin, um, where we'd be bringing cold water across a basin. Um, and in this particular case, we're, we're we're interested in coral reefs that, that thrive in warm water. Um, so where might we find those? On the western side of a basin, an eastern side of the basin, or, or just kind of anywhere uh, within a basin. Um, turns out it's actually the western side of the basin, right? So this kind of makes sense. Um, if we think about the North Pacific right here, um, we know that we have a, uh, a gyre that works in a clockwise motion. Um, so as it comes down to the equator, let me go back. As we move to the equator, we're grabbing warm water and transporting warm water to this region, moving it up. Um, if we think about the, the eastern side of the boundary, we're grabbing cold water and then bringing cold water down. So in this case, um, that's why we see everything kind of teeing up on the, uh, on the western basin. All right. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, 18 to 30 degrees C, they require uh, very strong sunlight and, and clear water. So uh, essentially they, they don't go too deep because they do require a lot of that sunlight as do those dinoflagellates that they uh, have that symbiotic relationship. Um, waves breaking over the coil is a, is a means of supplying nutrients and churning oxygen into the system. Um, and they require pretty consistent um, salinity. Uh, substrate that they form on is typically hard and rocky bottom. Uh, that's just to keep the young polyps um, from kind of disengaging from the sand, having something to grab onto to, to um, move through those, those juvenile years. This is kind of how a typical coral reef would stack up on a uh, volcanic island. Um, in this area, it's not constantly shallow. 
but you might get um, some coral uh, growing in these shallower areas. As it does grow, some dies off um, and begins to fall into these deeper areas, and then more coral is able to uh, kind of grow on top of that. So that's kind of how these uh, end up being formed over time. The reef will, will push out, pieces will die off and fall off the side, eventually piling up, um, creating a, a new surface or substrate for, for live coral to, to grow on. Um, actually a, a very interesting process. Um, so these are, are not extremely common um, as far as areas of the, the world are concerned, as far as like just general area that they cover, um, but they are habitat for about 25% of, of all marine species. So uh, doesn't take up much of the ocean, these coral regions, but they do house a huge proportion um, of, the, of the aquatic life in the oceans. Um, considered more diverse than tropical rainforests, um, many countries uh, with coral reefs uh, get a huge portion of their income from tourism just to visit those areas, the Great Barrier Reef um, probably being a, a huge example of that. Um, and then uh, kind of a little side benefit, uh, they protect coastlines from, from waves and tsunamis, right? So if you're living on the coastline here and a wave is coming in, it's going to break over this, uh, this reef prior to it making it to the coastline where you're at, right? So a little, little added benefit. Um, finally, let's think about what's in the, the very, very deep open, uh, ocean, so the abyssal plains. So um, deep ocean is, is very hard to get to, obviously extremely high pressures. We need very expensive and specialized equipment to get down there. So as a result, we've only explored a very tiny, tiny uh, area of the ocean floor. Um, very dark, very cold, and very high pressure. As a result, the organisms that live down there um, have to be very, very uh, specialized. Um, some common animals uh, you see here, um, some, some sea urchins, some brittle stars, um, a lot of things that travel very slow and require very, very little um, nutrient uptake. So uh, it's a very rough, rough life out there. Um, some of the common animals, tripod fish, um, some deep water corals, there's a handful of um, hags and, and, and sharks. Um, basically, a lot of stuff that uh, are, are opportunistic feeders. So we would kind of consider them on land like our like our vultures or or our crows, um, something along those lines. As something dies in the in the main column of water, it falls to the ocean bottom and these things kind of just scavenge and, and, and clean up. Um, a few very specialized areas, one of them being hydrothermal vents. So um, along some mid-ocean ridges, we're very, very close to uh, some, some magma under the crust that heats up the water and things get uh, very, very interesting. In these places, um, obviously it's very deep, so we can't photosynthesize. So we uh, have uh, uh, chemosynthesis instead. So these very high temperatures um, and a lot of the chemicals, uh, some of these animals are able to uh, perform synthesis and obtain energy uh, using these high temperatures and, and some of these chemicals. Um, these these hydrothermal vents, these hot vents, um, are very short in duration, some only lasting um, a decade, some only lasting a few years. So a lot of these ecosystems uh, grow very fast um, and, then, and then crash uh, just as quickly as that, as that vent turns off. We also have cold seeps, so these are very cold vents. Um, these tend to last uh, much longer uh, and the animals grow uh, a lot slower. Um, a lot of these are found over pockets of, of methane or hydrogen sulfide, uh, and those seeps um, kind of uh, take place over the process of, of uh, thousands of years. So uh, those gases are being excreted pretty much constantly. And, and those, those gases then um, also facilitate some of that uh, chemosynthesis. Um, otherwise... Uh, the, the very, very deep ocean, the stuff that we haven't even seen yet um, and, and we've just been able to get like cores from, um, we've discovered that there's uh, diverse microbial activity. So uh, this kind of makes sense. Um, microbes are, are, are the decomposers, um, so we would anticipate seeing them anywhere where some debris can possibly fall down um, and, and then be processed. It remains to be seen if there's any other life down there. 
um, but we do know that there is an, an active uh, microbial community uh, performing decomposition. Um, all right, so we, we made it through uh, the, uh, the, the ecosystems and uh, the types of organisms that we have in the ocean. Uh, next week, we will wrap up with uh, human impacts um, and see kind of what we've been doing uh, to, to impact the ocean and things that we can change in the future to uh, ensure the, the, uh, the health and safety of, of our ocean and the creatures within it. So I hope you learned a lot during this lecture. If you need uh, any, any answers or if anything was confusing, feel free to email me or ask me during uh, discussion. Otherwise, I hope you have a good day and uh, good luck on your test next Tuesday. I know you guys will do great. Thanks.